So good evening, and uh, welcome to the uh, College of Letters and Sciences uh, Community Lecture Series. Um, I'm Eric Yaki, I'm serving as the Dean of the College, and uh, I, get, <laughs> I get to introduce people, but I do very informally. I at least give a few basics and then kind of let them loose. Um, so I, I wanted to, before I start though, so I don't forget, um, I do know there are students here, I think, in History 102, Dr. Lopet and this class, that provides credit. It's great, um, but if you are here and you know for that particular, make sure that you sign on the sheet over here so we don't miss you, and we can get that to her. So I don't want to forget that. All right. Um, so um, Professor uh, Dona Warren came to us um, in 1995, right? Mm -hmm. So she finished her doctoral work at the University of Minnesota, um, philosopher. She's been working at the dean's office. She's been heading up various initiatives on campus since she's been here. Um, her latest and greatest, I think, is working on the Critical Thinking Initiative, which has actually had a profound impact on our campus, um, you know, throughout the four colleges and the way the way we're thinking about our curriculum. And so, just super excited to have uh, Dona come and speak to us about the Critical Thinking Initiative. So, oh, thank you, thank you, Dean Yonke. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would like to especially thank Scott Tappa and Dean Yonke and all of you for showing up. I'm just delighted that you all came. There's about half again as many people here as I was expecting. So it's, it's wonderful. And some of you know me, and some of you have heard me speak before, and you still showed up. So I'm just, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Um, so I, would, I don't know if you, there's no reason why you wouldn't know this, but um, I had to write that in July when I was invited to do this. And you know, in, in July, the, the next April, seems like 100 years, uh, in, in the future, and so I thought, oh, sure, I'll do it. What should I call it? Oh, the critical function of critical thinking. That sounds cute, you know, because that's critical and critical in it. And, um, and I wrote that. And then I promptly forgot about it and went on with my life. And then, you know, a month and a half or so ago, I thought, yeah, this is coming up. I should think about what I'll say. So I brought this out again, and I looked at it, and I thought, well, uh, this I could do. That's kind of easy. I can easily explain what we are doing to integrate critical thinking instruction throughout the curriculum. No brainer. OK, so I, sh I also promised that I would have you learn some critical thinking concepts and skills. That's a little harder, because there is a slew of them. So which ones should I choose? I'll do that second. Then I looked at critical thinking is increasingly important in an ever more complex world. I mean, that sounds right, doesn't it? I was pretty sure that was right. But I had no idea if it was actually right. <laughs> so I thought, well, I don't know. Um, is it true? And if so, why? And then I thought, oh, good grief. What the heck is that? What is the critical function of critical thinking? Um, presumably, there is one. There might be lots. But I, I, I was at a loss. And I thought, well. I'll start to write this thing from the beginning, and I'll see if I get there. And I think I got somewhere. And it'll be interesting to see if you agree with me. Uh, if you think that what I'm identifying is a critical function of critical thinking is what you would identify. But let's start by talking about what we are doing, and especially why we are doing it. OK, so let's talk about why we're doing anything at all related to critical thinking. One reason, of course, is that educators nationwide, presumably internationally, unanimously embrace this as an important critical thinking, an important learning outcome. I mean, I don't think anyone, and to some extent, I think this is problematic. If, if you go up to anybody, any teacher that I know, and say, do you do critical thinking in your class? They are like morally obligated to say yes. <laughs> if, if they say no, it's like, I, I officially acknowledge that I have abdicated any sense of educational responsibility that I have. I think this is kind of a problem, actually, because I think there are other important learning outcomes. And there is the danger that if everyone is doing it, it means so much that nobody knows what the heck they're talking about. Um, but nonetheless, we have institutionally embraced this as one of the top goals of our general education program, the GEP. So this is taken straight from our catalog. Right? Employers also want it. This is no surprise. Um, if you just Google which I did to make sure, right? <laughs> Employers want critical thinking, and there's lots of stuff. Employers do want it. And a study came out um, a few years ago now, but these, these results have been replicated repeatedly over time, that you know, 
81% of employers say that critical analytical thinking is a very important um, characteristic in their employees. So, data point. Educators, employers want critical thinking. I think we can take this as established. Another Im important and kind of less fortunate data point from my point of view is there's some evidence to say that we as an educational industry are not doing the kind of job we would like to be doing. This is from the same study put out by the American uh, Association of Colleges and Universities. This, the, the, blue, the heavy blue bar, dark blue, is the percentage of employers who believe that recent college graduates are well prepared in a certain area. And the light blue bar is the percentage of recent college graduates who self-report that they feel well prepared in that area. Behold the 20 point gap, right? 66% of recent college graduates say that they are well prepared in critical and analytical thinking. Now, from my point of view, that would be alarming because I think 66% is too low. But 26% of employers think that college graduates are well prepared in this area. That is exceedingly alarming, right? And it's not just perception. We have some kind of hardish numbers. The Wall Street Journal reported in 2017, this is a little bit more recent, that um, according to the Collegiate Learning Assessment Plus exam, um, a lot of students fail to improve in critical thinking over four years, even among flagship institutions, right? So I want to be absolutely clear, especially for those of you watching at home, that I'm not talking about a UWSP problem. This is not a problem for us here in central Wisconsin. This is a problem, full stop, right? Um, so the question is then, why? Presumably we're all smart people, at least smart enough. We think this is important, we want to do it, it's not being done, why? I humbly submit that this is part of the answer to the why. Um, critical thinking is a massive beast. I mean, if I were to ask you, what is critical thinking? I think the answers would cluster, so I do think it's a thing, right? But it's such a multifaceted thing that there's lots of stuff that makes, that, that makes it up. Huge number of skills, huge number of dispositions. Um, instructors do have honest to goodness expertise in critical thinking in their disciplines. Right? That's part of what we have to have. Um, which we've generally picked up largely by osmosis as we've progressed through our, 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 you know, our educational pathways. Um, I have my PhD in philosophy, in philosophy. I did happen to have a course in, in critical thinking as an undergraduate, just as like a general ed. But that was just because I happened to take it. There was never a point in my professional training where someone said, hey, you have to have this class, ever. Right? I certainly never had a class in here's how you teach it. Right? And I might double back to that later. But I kind of just picked up how to do it and maybe picked up how to teach it, maybe not. And furthermore, the way these skills and dispositions are described differ wildly across disciplinary boundaries. So the way a skill is described in history might not be the same way that skill is described in English, might not be the way that skill is described in biology, might not be the way that skill is described in business. So even assuming, and this is a major assumption, that that same skill is taught in all of those disciplines, that chance the students are going to recognize it because it's called different, right? So this is the situation, and yet, we somehow expect instructors who have untutored expertise in this to know how to teach it to their students. And we somehow expect students to cobble together a coherent set of critical thinking skills that they can apply after they graduate. That's it. I think, frankly, I submit that's an insane thing to want, given where we're at. That's fundamentally irrational. There's just no way we should have expected anything other than those, that data that I showed you earlier. So, what we are doing here. Now, I, I could have started this, I, I toyed with it, but I thought this really, this really would be narcissistic to start with 1995 when I joined the faculty. That, that really would have been, but 
But I want to tell you a story from 1995 when I joined the faculty, because I don't know how many of you know about the job market in philosophy. I'm hoping you don't, frankly. <laughs> Because it's depressing, it's frightening, it's horrifying. Right? Um, it's, there, are, there are not that many tenure track positions opening up any given year in philosophy, on the one hand. On the other hand, there are quite a few people who are aspiring to and getting their PhDs in philosophy because you know the glamour. And so, <laughs> and so then you have the job market is just insanely competitive. It's insanely competitive. And there's a lot of luck to it. There's a lot of luck. So when I was finishing um, my, my, putting my, my dossier together when I was in graduate school, you know, uh, sending things out, I knew I really wanted to teach because I liked teaching. I had taught all through graduate school, mostly remedial math, actually, developmental math, because my undergraduate degree is in math. So I taught that. I loved teaching it, loved teaching college algebra. I loved teaching formal logic, loved it, loved it. I taught critical thinking once, and it was a disaster. It was just, I, I swear, I got through that quarter with my hair on fire. It was just, it was just a disaster of a course. So when I was applying for jobs, people would say, what do you want to teach? And I, my standard answer, I kid you not, was I will teach anything as long as it's not critical thinking. <laughs> so I got my, my, my on-campus interview here, showed up, right? Loved the town, loved the people who interviewed me, just loved, loved, loved. In fact, I think I saw Richard Feldman. Richard Feldman, are you here? Did I see Richard Feldman come in? Thought, uh, is, was anyone here when I came? Probably not. Um, just wonderful people interviewed me. I fell in love with the town, really wanted to come here. Um, and I assumed I wouldn't ever get a job. So this was like the brass ring of all brass rings. And they said, well, we really want someone to teach critical thinking. And I said, I would love to teach critical thinking. <laughs> so I, I, I thought the interview went fairly well. I was flying back home. I got back to the University of Minnesota. I went back to my advisor's office and said, I think the interview went well. I think I might get the job. I think they'll ask me to teach critical thinking. I have no idea how to do that successfully, right? <laughs> so at, at this point, um, uh, employers were still, not, not employers, but book publishers were still sending you know, instructors examination copies of books. And so my advisor just kind of randomly pulled a book that I could tell he'd never opened that had critical thinking on it from his bookshelf and he handed it to me and he said, here's a textbook. So I walked, I walked to the grad student lounge and I opened it. And it was like the skies opened up and heaven shined down upon me because I saw my very first argument map and I knew that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. It was like, behold the truth, right? Absolutely. So you will see an argument map, and hopefully you will have that same kind of an epiphany. Um, so then I came here, taught critical thinking, loved it, loved it, loved it, taught it every semester since. And, um, and because then I was just you know, an evangelist for argument mapping, I was talking to people about argument mapping wherever I could. If, if someone, I'm in an elevator with people, I'm talking to people about element. mapping. Um, and so then in the summer of 2015, got a grant, got a group of people together to talk about this um, interdisciplinarily. They, we tried to implement it in some courses, I think successfully, in 15, 16. And all along, you know, I, I and other people were talking to groups. Um, the, we then had it as like one of our, our major programs to support our continued accreditation. That's called the Quality Initiative. You don't really, higher, HLC is Higher Learning Commission. That's our accrediting body. Um, we formed faculty exploration groups, which would be people from across the disciplines, instructors from all over, talking about what does critical thinking look like in your discipline? How would you define it? What skills are important in biology and business and English and history? Um, and then presenting elsewhere at various institutions. And now we have, I'm just so thrilled with my colleagues. This is just a great place to be. Um, critical thinking pilot courses from across the institution 
all five colleges, including university colleges, participating in this. Um, 50 instructors are in some way involved. 69 sections are being offered with critical thinking designation. We are meeting with local leaders in business and education to try to connect those dots externally. And we are planning, you know, across all relevant digits, to start a uh, critical thinking center uh, probably this summer. That's designed to kind of shepherd this work, carry it through, and institutionalize it. So that's what we're doing. That's point one. Okay. Now, point two, I promised you critical thinking concepts and skills. I thought, well, what, a, a good place to start, I suppose, would be what is critical thinking? Because there are lots of definitions, and you should probably know how we are thinking about it. Right now, this is subject to revision at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. This is how we are defining it as the process of identifying, analyzing, evaluating, and constructing reasoning in deciding what conclusions to draw or actions to take. So thinking about what you think and about what you do. There are two broad components. The skill components, like doing stuff, recognizing fallacies, taking apart an argument and putting it back together again, um, using some kind of a technique to solve a problem or make a decision. And then dispositions or habits of mind, like curiosity. Okay. By the way, questions so far? My own classes are pretty interactive, so I'm not, frankly, used to just talking at people this much. So if, if you have any sort of, you know, just signal or something. Okay. So my own classes, speaking of my own classes, I focus on argument analysis a lot. And an argument in this context is not a fight, it's not a dispute. It's a unit of reasoning that attempts to convince you, other people or yourself or establish the objective truth of some claim, which we call the conclusion, by citing other claims as evidence. We call those evidence reasons. At least I do in my class. These, these terms can be a little bit um, slippery, but that's certainly a, a not, not an unstandard way to define these things. And then argument mapping, which I think I've mentioned once or twice before, is a way to render the structure of an argument easily discernible. So I'm going to show you argument mapping. I advise you to, to, to fasten your seat belts and keep them fastened for the remainder of the flight in the event of unexpected rough air, because I'm going to go fast. Here's an argument. Dogs can learn tricks, therefore dogs are intelligent. I never promise profundity. Right? <laughs> I, I just want, in fact, I want something that's not profound because I want to focus on the structure. I don't want any bright, shiny content to distract us. Okay. So dogs can learn tricks, therefore dogs are intelligent. Are you ready? This is going to change your life. You ready? Mm. Argument map. Notice the conclusion is at the top. The support is at the bottom. Those elements are clearly distinguished one from another. And the nature of the relationship is visible. You can point to it. That's the support relationship. Now, you might think, big deal. I mean, how is that better than that? Well, it might not be better than that, but it's better than this. Well, that's an argument, by the way. Sorry. That's the conclusion. That's the reason. Technical term, that's the inference, the relationship of support. OK, there will be no quiz on this later, but that's what they're called. <laughs> I can also write that argument in a different way. I could say dogs are intelligent because they can learn tricks. This is one of the things that started getting me really interested in critical thinking as something to think about from a scholarly, pedagogical point of view. I noticed that people, in general, find it a lot easier to analyze the argument, that is to say, distinguish between the reason and conclusion and identify the relationship between those things. When the argument is written like as, as it is at the top with the word therefore, then it is at the bottom with the word because. Why is this, you might ask? I think it's because the top one, dogs can learn tricks, therefore dogs are intelligent. The conclusion, dogs are intelligent, follows the reason in the passage and also follows from the reason, logically that follows and follows from relationship is inverted when you use because in the middle. Here, dogs are intelligent because they can learn tricks. 
they can learn the, the reason follows the conclusion in the passage, right? But the conclusion still follows from the reason and the logic. Do you see that? It, just, it, it imposes just an incrementally heavier cognitive burden. And when the content gets tricky, that cognitive burden is sufficient to derail understanding of the argument. No one would ever be seriously confused about dogs are intelligent learning tricks. But in other content, that, that's enough to throw people. Here's another relationship. Dogs are affectionate. Affectionate animals make good pets. Therefore, dogs make good pets. Behold the map. Those are dependent reasons. It shows that dogs are affectionate needs to work with affectionate animals make good pets to support dogs make good pets, right? And again, we can write it differently. This relationship of dependent reasons can be tricky for people to discern. So here's just a handy trick. And this is like the skill that I promised you. Okay. You can recognize dependent reasons by thinking of them as puzzle pieces. If you put those two puzzle pieces together, the whole reason they can connect at all is that they have that circle bit in common, right? But because that's where they connect, that circle bit is not visible in the resulting shape. You see that? I wish this were a little lower so I could actually point rather than just sort of gesticulating at the screen. Um, so if we take a look at the concepts or the, or the claims there, dogs are affectionate, affectionate animals make good pets. Now this is the audience participation portion of the program. <laughs> What concept do those claims have in common or word? Affectionate. Affectionate. Good. So that's the circle bit. You're not going to see that in the conclusion. What you're going to see is dog make good pets and behold the conclusion, right? That puzzle piece test can be used to figure out what follows. For instance, people take their beliefs and actions to be justified, largely. They assume they are. Justified beliefs and actions are supported by reasons. So just think for a bit. What do you think would follow? And I will hum a theme song. Do, 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 do. You think you see it? Turn to your, yes, Professor Horn. People take their beliefs and actions to be supported by reasons. Excellent, and I didn't even plant them. Oh. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And you're all <laughs> my colleague, my, my, my beautiful assistant, Professor Horn. Um, you can also use that to figure out, and this is where it's really important, to figure out what people are assuming when they move from one claim to another. So suppose, if we take a look at that puzzle piece shape up there, suppose that the, that the bottom rightmost shape we're not there. You could figure out what it would be, right? You would look and you would say, well, the top shape has a square, bot, square bit. The bottom shape has a square bit. So I don't need to worry about those. What I need to worry about is somehow connecting the triangle bit and the circle bit. And you would sort of retrofit something like you see on the right, correct? So let's do that here. What's in common here? We should assume that people, people's beliefs are supported by reasons, conclusion. It's respectful to assume that someone's beliefs and actions are supported by reason. What are they both talking about? Well, assuming that other people's beliefs and actions are supported by reasons, right? That's the square bit. So what we need to do is somehow connect up. It's respectful to, and we should, right? You get something like, we should respect other people. Got it? That's dependent reasons. Independent reasons are a little bit easier. Dogs can alert people to intruders. They can help people to make friends, too. Therefore, everyone should own a dog. I like dogs. In case you can't tell, I like dogs a lot. Hi, Buster, if you're watching at home. Yes. Um, <laughs> independent reasons, right? They don't need each other. They function independently. And you can also write it separately. You can write it with the conclusion in the middle if you have independent reasons. Now we're getting a little bit steeper. I'm just going to show you the map here, because here we have objections. I just want to show you that it can be done. We should have therapy dogs in schools. No, you shouldn't. This is an objection now. The reason you shouldn't is the dogs would be a distraction. Now you have objections to objections, otherwise known as rebuttals. The objection to the claim that dogs would be a distraction is no. In fact, they help students to concentrate. 
And then there's another kind of objection, which is the, we allow other potential distractors. Those are fundamentally different kinds of objections, right? There is what I call the not so objection and what I call the so what objection, right? The not so is exactly what it sounds like. I disagree. The so what is, huh, even if, who cares? We can transform a so what objection into a not so objection by filling in a missing premise like that. We just made explicit what we were assuming there. Dogs would be a distraction, therefore we should not have therapy dogs in schools. Well, that's assuming that if something's a distractor, we shouldn't have it in school. And now what was a so what objection is a not so objection. That's a fairly advanced move, right? As I said, there will be no quiz. But that's, that's what mapping's all about. It is incredibly, incredibly powerful. It really is, right? Because what happens is you start to see, when you look at an argument, you don't just see. Claim, 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 out pops the conclusion. You see that arguments are crystalline structures, really. They're not amorphous at all. These claims have precise relationships to each other, and there are only four relationships they could conceivably be. Support, objection, dependent, independent. That's it, right? Once you start to see arguments like that, you can track more complicated arguments. Sometimes instructors have expressed um, skepticism at this point. They, the, the, the objection, sometimes when I go around and I talk to faculty groups, um, <laughs> I once had someone, after I presented this, I can't remember where I've repressed it. It was not here, it was another institution. <laughs> I, I presented basically this, this was a few years ago, and someone raised his hand and he said, how would this help my students to understand the argument in Moby Dick? And I thought, I don't know who you're teaching, but that's not my concern, right? I mean, I, that's, that's, a, that's a completely different thing. And I, I just sort of gestured to, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty sure it would help. But I couldn't, I mean, that's, that's all I could do. It was a completely lame answer. I was utterly blindsided. But a few years ago, a couple years ago, something happened. It was in the summer, so it got dark late. And I was upstairs doing what lots of people do. I was sort of texting on my phone. And it was dark. And a, a message came up from my neighbor, Joan. Joan has chickens. Before she got chickens, she said, I want you to know I'm going to get chickens. Is that OK with, with you guys? And I said, are you going to eat the chickens? Because what I needed to know was, should I get attached, really? You know? And she said, no, we're not, not going to eat the chickens. I said, oh, get chickens, right? So she got chickens, and she named them like souffle and omelet and quiche and little egg names. So I'm up. It was dark. I'm up in the bedroom. I'm, I'm texting. A pops message from Joan. Omelet's missing. Um, could she be in your garage? I thought she was interested in your garage. So I said, she said, could you, could you check in the morning? In the morning? Like, I'm going to, in the morning? Are you kidding me? So I got up, and I, I threw on, and I came downstairs, and I told my husband, Mark, I said, oh, what's missing? So we, we got our flashlights, and we went out in the dark, and we were going around. We were calling Omelette. I don't know why we were calling Omelette. We were, we were walking around with our flashlight, Omelette. Omelet, no omelet. It did turn out that omelet was actually roosting in the lilies of the valleys next to our house. So happy ending to the story, right? But, but walk back in, no sign of omelet. And here's what I learned that night. Omelet happens to be a black chicken. It's hard to find a black chicken in the dark. But it's even harder if you don't know what a chicken looks like. Oh. And exposing students to, or anyone for that matter, to look at this shape, look at this shape, see these relationships. Yeah, they don't necessarily always need to think that way, but sometimes things get tough. Sometimes it gets dark. And when you know what a chicken looks like, when you know what these relationships are, it's a heck of a lot easier to spot them. Trust me, right? Because it's a lot easier for me since I had my epiphany than it was before. So here's kind of when things get dark. This isn't a terribly difficult argument, but let's just take a look at it. It's a little bit more sophisticated. Um, 
we shouldn't offer critical thinking courses. For one thing, critical thinking courses are worthwhile only if there are general thinking, critical thinking skills, and there aren't general critical thinking skills because critical thinking is invariably subject specific. That, by the way, is an argument in the literature. For another thing, courses in critical thinking run counter to the primary aim of education because they don't require students to learn important facts about the world. Of course, some might claim that we should offer critical thinking courses because they make it easier for people to win arguments. They don't, though, because critical thinking skills make us as critical of our own positions as that of others. Besides, even if critical thinking did help us to win arguments, who says that's always a good thing? Right? Now, that's a fairly short argument, um, but there's more structure there. This is that structure. Okay. There's two lines of reasoning in support, one sort of line of reasoning in opposition, and all of the relationships that you see there are nothing more than those specific relationships that we saw, right? Support, objection, dependent reason, independent reason. There can be nothing more than that. There just can't be. Once we see that that's the argument, now we can evaluate it. There's a premise for you. What do you think about that premise? I'm just curious. As I said, this is, a, this is actually a debate in the literature. The reasoning is it doesn't make sense to talk about a cross-curricular critical thinking program because critical thinking as it is instantiated in, say, history, and critical thinking as it is instantiated in, say, chemistry, have nothing in common. What do you think? I'm just curious. I mean, you've, you've, had, you've had like all of 30 seconds to think about that. You should have an opinion now. Obviously, I disagree or I wouldn't be doing this work, right? I wouldn't be trying to have a critical thinking pilot program with courses from all over the institution. I think that's not true. I think there are certain things that are common, basic standards of good reasoning, even though they might look a little different in, in different disciplines. I think there's a common core. Let's take a look at that center line of reasoning. What do you think about that? Now, this is really where I want to point, but I can't point. Do you see a problem there? Anyone want to articulate the second line of reasoning? If you see a problem, I planted what I think is a problem. Anyone spot it? Jerry? Yeah. You're talking about the very middle, right? Very middle. Well, it's that facts are independent of yeah, the facts are independent of critical thinking. Is there another problem? You might be looking at the same one, Angela. Um, it shows that the primary aim of education is to learn facts about the world. That's kind of what I had in mind, right? Although I think what you articulated is a problem too. By the way, in case I'm not sure if this is picking up, one objection was that there's a sharp distinction between critical thinking and facts. Facts are independent of critical thinking. That's certainly disputable. And then there's this also this additional assumption that um, the important thing about critical thinking is to assimilate facts. That's the one that I had in mind. That's the problem that I planted. And that would be there, right? It's that inference problem. The problem isn't that this is false. I think that's probably true. That's not a primary aim of critical thinking. But does it follow from that that they run counter to the aim of education? I don't think so. Only if we assume and now we're going to do that trick we did before. We're going to try to change, we're going to try to fill in a missing assumption. Can you see what, that, what is assumed there? Courses in critical thinking don't require students to learn important facts about the world and blah, blah, blah. So courses in critical thinking run counter to the primary aim of education. I think we already said what was assumed there, right? What's assumed there is that the primary aim of education is learning important facts about the world. I am not denying that that is a primary aim of education, right? Let me be clear. It might even be, for all I know, the primary aim. I don't know. It's just, I'm not sure that we can really assume that. So by filling in that missing premise, now the inference is fine. If you believe this and you believe this, you're going to be hard pressed to deny the subconclusion. That's that middle claim. But I think this is at the very least questionable. I think that there's other important things than that. Which brings us to point three, um, which was something about how critical thinking is ever more important in today's society. Right. So are you ready to go on? Here we go. 
I just said that I think that there are other things besides assimilating important facts that are crucial to education. So let's think about what education is all about. This is a caricature of one model of education, but I think it might look a little bit familiar. On the one hand, you have the land of knowledge production. What happens there is a bunch of really smart people get together, they think hard, they reason, they eventually all agree, they come to, come to some consensus. That then generates knowledge, which can be detached and abstracted from that edifice that justifies it. Popped over here to the land of knowledge transmission, where someone who is appropriately credentialed dumps that into other people's heads. Right? I mean, does that sound kind of familiar? Yeah. That might be the way it works sometimes. Again, I'm not saying that caricatures always have a, you know, a basis in fact. That's why the picture of an elephant is a really lousy caricature of Bill Clinton, for instance, right? I mean, they have nothing in common. Um, thank you. Uh, that was my own phone, by the way. So yeah. Yeah, no, I, I interrupted myself. Yeah, sure. <laughs> that's my own husband, by the way, so that's <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, so, so, why, so why is, given the fact that this does bear some resemblance, there are important facts to know, absolutely important facts to know. I think even then, though, critical thinking has some role because understanding the reasoning behind the claims does help people to understand the claims. The best example in, that I know of for this was, I don't know, I was in junior high, I think. I was studying history, which was being poorly taught to me at that time, in that instant. And I stumbled across the following fact. World War I started because, can anyone fill that in? Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated. And I thought, that's a little bit of an overreaction. <laughs> I knew there was more to it than that. I knew there was more to it than that. And, but it, it was just so unsatisfying. It was so unsatisfying to me. It was, it was years and years and years later when I watched a documentary that kind of showed how all the dominoes were lined up and, and, and how things were politically structured at that time in such a way that this assassination had that consequence. I had that intellectual itch for decades, right? And even though I kind of knew it, if it had been Jeopardy and someone would have said, you know, I, I could have answered that question correctly, but no understanding, no understanding, right? So understanding the causal chain certainly helps. And then, of course, we do hope that we, we generate knowledge producers here so that eventually some of these people will come over here and then they can reason to generate new knowledge. So, you know, it is important, even on this picture, that people think critically, but sometimes there's not consensus. In fact, I think I heard a, a few, when I, when I got to that point and I said, and then everyone agrees. Do they, right, do they? My own discipline philosophy is predicated, it is the art of disagreement. That, that's exactly what it is. I mean, you don't get published until you can find something to complain about and something that somebody else published. That's what you do, right? That's why we're so popular. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, sometimes there's no consensus. So then what? Well, sometimes there's no consensus because what we're dealing with are value claims, right? And value claims are notorious for this. There can be reasonable people, I think, who disagree about them. Um, sometimes they are scientific claims that have not been completely established yet. Sometimes there are scientific claims that have been completely established, but there is some internet group that just decides to be bloody-minded and say, no, the Earth is actually flat, right? And then they, they get some kind of following. So even where there was consensus, consensus can kind of evaporate. So what then? This is the position where a lot of, a lot of people find themselves. What to do? in a world of sort of evaporating consensus. And I do think this might have changed a little bit um, when, 
when you can have these kind of like self-contained discourse communities on the internet. I think that can foment an environment where, where consensus is hard to come by. So how should we react to that? There is some study about um, the, the levels of epistemological development in college students, but I don't think this is just college students. How college students think about knowledge from when they enter to when they graduate. This is a simplification. So my apologies to everybody who actually knows this literature. This is a simplification. This is the position where people often start. There is knowledge. The experts have it. And they tell it to us, right? That's very much the initial position. So I'm just kind of a passive recipient of what smarter people know. Right? Then we find out that sometimes these smarter people disagree. And there is this temptation. The experts disagree. Ergo, there is no truth. There, are, there is no knowledge. There are no facts. And it's just kind of opinion and if we know one thing about opinion, it's everyone has a right to them, and they're all equal. Right? This is an attractive position. It's awfully easy to stop there. But what at least I personally want to get my students to is this. Even when there are, there's no consensus, some positions are better than others because they are better justified than others. Right? And I'm not unique in wanting my, in wanting my students, wanting myself, wanting my friends and family, which is why I'm so popular, to get, to get to that place, right, I think. So the idea that, yeah, we can, we can evaluate. It's not that just every, every interpretation of this movie is as good as any other. Any, any understanding of this scientific literature is as good as any other, because out there somewhere there is disagreement. No. What we can evaluate are the reasons that we have for the things that we think and say and do. And that's where critical thinking is. So I think that's why critical thinking is increasingly important. So when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, I think that's probably right, right? But here's one of those questions where people disagree. What is the critical function of critical thinking? Just for fun, I went to Facebook. I posted something. I said, hey, I'm giving this talk. What do you think it is, right? <laughs> Tell me, what do you think it is? And I got people. Um, uh, the answers clustered, but they were, they were different. There wasn't a, well, this is the obvious answer. So kind of ironically, I hope you appreciate the irony of this, this is one of those questions that you really need critical thinking to answer because there are a variety of answers that can be equally well maintained, but some answers might be better than others. Right? I ask my students this at the beginning of the semester. And it's incredibly informative. I ask them to write, to tell me, write down, what do you want to learn in the course? And the answers tend to cluster in a few ways. So this is why I'm talking now about a critical function of critical thinking rather than the. Because I think there's lots of them. And, I, and I'm not going to, I, I would never purport to claim that what I am going to advocate here is the only important function. But I think it's an important function. Um, one thing that students say they want to be able to do is avoid falsehoods and get at the truth, or something along those lines, right? I want to avoid being taken in. I want to be able to spot someone who's just trying to deceive me. I want to be able to use information appropriately to draw conclusions. That all kind of falls in that category. Then there are the more sort of maybe debate oriented who want to win arguments, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I get a lot of I want to think quickly, right? I want to have a quick answer, which I always caution people against. Right? Because then I can't get the quick answer? No, no, no. Because I think that often the quick answer is the wrong answer. Or at least speed is not a virtue when you're thinking about something that's interesting, I think, generally. Um, but certainly the desire to defend positions, to not cave prematurely, to be able to respond to objections, these are all laudable things to want. But then some people say this. They want to understand other people better. And that's the one that always sort of, at least right now, makes my heart warm. This is the one I want to talk about for the time remaining. I think a critical function of critical thinking is that it helps us to understand each other better. Because remember these arguments that we played with a little bit before? right? People generally take their beliefs and actions to be justified. If they didn't, they wouldn't have those beliefs. You can't go around and think, 
I have this belief, but I think it's probably false. That's a strange position to be in, right? Um, we should probably assume that other people are taking their beliefs in that way, maybe with some justification. Why? Well, because it's a sign of respect, and that's how we should treat each other. Don't explain other people away, essentially, right? Personally, part of my ethos. Um, so if we take that seriously, and we, we take a look and try to think, what can the lens, how can the lens of critical thinking help us do that more effectively? Well, it can help us to go beyond understanding what other people think, to try to get a grasp of why they think it in terms that would be recognizable to the people themselves, right? Not, oh, you just think that because you are, I don't know. You, you, can't, you can't cope with reality as it is. You have erected this edifice of self-deception, and that's why you think this, right? No one ever says, you know why I think this? It's because I can't cope with reality as it is. And so I have erected this edifice of self-deception. Nobody ever says that. I mean, everyone thinks they have good reasons for the things they think. So you know, critical thinking might be able to help us to understand that and kind of get in that person's head a little bit, which then will help us to illuminate points of agreement and disagreement and to disagree without disparaging each other because we have some clue about how the world might look to this person. So, for instance, tell me if this conversation sounds familiar to you. Vaccination should be optional. You're an idiot. All the time. All the time. Vaccination should be mandatory. You're a fascist. <laughs> Not, not an unfamiliar dynamic, right? At least I've seen it. Look what's going on. We have people advancing positions, and then the response attacks the person, doesn't engage the position. The technical term for this, if you want to have a fancy word when you leave, is abusive ad hominem, right? Mm -hmm. To attack the person, to abuse the individual, to attack the hominem. Imagine this instead. Vaccination should be optional because. Parents should have the final authority over their child's health care because. If the government assumes responsibility for children's health care, then other parental rights are endangered. <coughs> Vaccination should be mandatory because. Herd immunity requires a certain critical mass of vaccinations. And there are people who can't be vaccinated who rely upon herd immunity, right? At that deeper level, we might, they might be able to agree, OK, individual liberty and communal responsibility are both important, right? You're not an idiot if you think that individual liberty is important. You're not a fascist if you think that communal responsibility is important. And then we can have a mutually respectful conversation about this. What's the appropriate balance? Will we figure it out to everyone's satisfaction? Of course not, right? Will no feelings ever be hurt and no toes ever stepped on? Of course not, right? Human beings are human beings. But I think that's a better conversation. So if we go back to like, what is the purpose of education to begin with, right? The primary aim of education is learning important facts about the world. That's an important aim, no doubt. But what I think thinking about critical thinking can help us see is at least an important aim of critical thinking in education in general is to help us go from conversations like this mm -hmm to conversations like this, right? And that is what I submit is a critical function of critical thinking. Thank you. And we have 10 minutes for questions. Or actually, depending upon five-ish. 
Are there? Any? Yes? Do you think the current elementary education system, at least, encourages students to not think critically because they're injured to control? I have honestly no idea. <laughs> I don't know. I, what I can say is, the question, by the way, is that do you think that the current elementary education system sort of um, is set up to not encourage critical thinking in virtue of teaching to the test and other things like that? Is that right? Yeah, and just, I mean, especially thinking of six, seven-year-olds, they're easier to control if they're, oh. if they're you know. OK, they're easier to control if they're in a group and not thinking critically. Is that the idea? Sometimes. I guess as a mother, I feel like that's what I see in the school. I mean, there, there, there is a difference between thinking critically and being obstinate, and they're often confused, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Um, I, I honestly don't know. I think what I can say is that I have had wonderful conversations, and they are ongoing, with educators in the K through 12 system here. And there is certainly a sincere commitment to doing critical thinking within, within the limits that they can. Um, so you know, as a matter of fact, is that happening? I really, that's outside my area of expertise. I don't know. Sir? Yes, Josh. First of all, it's always like a master class to listen to you for an hour. Oh, well, thank uh, you. Ditto, by the way. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could go back to the, like the, the, one of the very beginning things that you mentioned about developing dispositions. Oh, yeah. And you have curiosity on there. I'm uh -huh. wondering if there are any others that you could talk about that must speak to, like what your goal, what a goal is. Or, uh, Isn't this the most annoying thing when people go back? And... <laughs> so, so Sorry other. Uh, um, no, it's not your I'm fault. I'm just wondering if there's a dis maybe a, a, di a good disposition for a teaching student or teaching people to understand each other would be something like this. Uh, we should develop a disposition where we, we would be inclined to agree with people that we would normally disagree with and that we should disagree with people that we would normally agree with. Oh, interesting. That's quite brilliant. Right. So, so, so intentionally <clears throat> trying to find... Common ground with people you disagree with. Right. It's breaking out of that echo chamber and, yeah. and trying to be more critical of the people in your echo chamber. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that that is, that's quite brilliant. Yeah, that, that would be good. I mean, the disposition, I, I planted curiosity here because I had intended to maybe um, go back to it a little bit because I think that one of the, I mean, to say you're an idiot and you're a fascist, those are singularly uncurious responses to people, right? I mean, rather than saying, oh, that's quite not the way I think. <laughs> Tell me more, right? Um, but that does presuppose, I mean, I'm a, and, and in philosophy, we all try to practice the art of charitable interpretation, right. right? Which is if you have two competing or multiple competing interpretations of a text or of an individual, one of them makes the author out to be idiotic or evil, and one of them makes the author out to be not so much. Go for the one that makes the author not so much, right? Um, yeah, I think that's a critical thinking virtue. Because I also think it's more accurate. I, I don't think that the world is populated by idiotic, evil people. And so I think that, by and large, the charitable interpretation is probably more likely to be the accurate interpretation. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, Kim. And then. Uh, check out Peter Elbow, the Believing Game. He oh. That's what you just described. OK. Um, speaking as a psychologist, one of the most disheartening things that we've discovered through research over the past few years is for, for many years we thought that when people were confronted with disconfirming evidence, they would abandon their beliefs and they would they would buy into whatever was presented to right. them. But there's a huge emotional and ego dimension to this. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how you advise somebody to educate, formally or informally, knowing that there's a huge emotional dimension underlying or behind all of these reasons. Right. I, well, I, I, and I don't know if this gets at the depth of the problem, right? But I really want my students to understand that a bad argument can have a true conclusion, right? So you can criticize an argument without disagreeing with the conclusion. Furthermore, falsehoods can be believed by intelligent people. So the individual themselves is protected by like two firewalls from any criticism of the argument itself. 
Um, and I also think that trying to find something good about the argument, right, so that they don't have to completely jettison the whole framework to say, this is, this is good. Yeah, I, I agree with that. At least it's good from my point of view, right? I think that can ameliorate somewhat the desire to double down. Mm -hmm. But I think, that, I think that that is so neurologically ingrained that I don't, know if I'm, I don't know if anything that I can say at the level I'm working would penetrate that deeply. Is that? Yeah, I think, I, I, that, and that's not to say that I don't think what we're doing is important. I think it is, but I don't think it's, it's not going to solve that. It's not going to solve confirmation bias. Yeah. I think, I, yes. Um, all I can say is that thanks for just answering my question because I was a little bit more simplistic. I was going to add, ask basically how critical thinking can work with emotion and bias. Right, yep, yep, Which yep. Basically, kind yeah. of answered. Yeah. Me, but, yeah, they take more of a semester course to really. It, it, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. And, and I, think, I think that, well, emotions, negative emotions, are always hard to deal with, right? And I'm like the least confrontational person I know, unless someone thinks they're at least less confrontational than I am, in which case I will agree with you because I won't want to fight. Um, but I think that, I, I think that, you know, not thinking critically is not going to is not going to put out any fires either, right? Yeah. Critical thinking at least has a tendency to put out some fires. If you if you ask with a spirit of genuine curiosity, oh, tell me tell me more about that belief, right? Rather than why do you think that? I mean, tone is everything here. But yeah, <laughs> Eric, I think are you? Okay. Yes. I, I just. Uh... Um, I think if every, uh, those who want to stick around and ask some questions, um, certainly I hope don't really want to stick around mm -hmm. and answer some, that'd mm -hmm. be great. Um, oh. And uh, so, uh, can I do one thing? Maybe. One person wants to see my shirt. Ah. <laughs> oh, demand evidence and think critically, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so again, if you want to go out and answer some, ask your questions and talk some more, by all means do. The library closes at 8, though, I'll tell you that, and they'll start with a little sound at about 10 till. Um, <laughs> it happens to us most weeks. Um, also, just want to point out that we do have one more of uh, the community lecture series on May 7th. It's going to be uh, Professor Brad Mace Martin talking about clean water, safe water, the basics of how water laws impact what you drink. Um, I think that'll also be a really fascinating topic to hear Brad Mace Martin talking about on May 7th. Um, so uh, first off, or I should say, make finals. Thank you. Thank Great. you, Eric. Thank you all.